Powers, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars to broadcast 256 regarding a murder. No description of suspect. Use brick as a weapon. That is all, Harmon. If you attend a football game tomorrow, friend, you'll see the referee and the captain of the opposing team go into a huddle. The fellow in the black and white striped blouse and white monkey pants tosses a coin into the air and pointing to one of the captains says, Call it! Heads! Heads it is! And thus is decided which team will kick off. The other getting a choice of gold, it will depend. A harmless enough form of gambling. But flipping a coin is no way to decide which gasoline is the best to pep up the running attack of your motor. If you listen to those who hit the line hardest and thus know the most about the game, the drivers of police cars, fire engines, and ambulances, you know that Rio Grande Crack is the all-around gasoline that delivers the goods for more public-serving emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. Tens of thousands of motors, too, like the way Rio Grande Crack charges the instant the ball is snapped. Gets out in the open with the speed of the wind. If your machine hasn't been clicking, friend, better sign up the all-time, all-American Rio Grande Crack to play on your team. It's the most highly endorsed gasoline sold in the West. Now it is again our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. The man whose story we are to hear tonight was not a man in the legal sense. He was only a boy. Yet such was his reputation that the sheriff of the parish in which he was born wired me that only death would stop his career of crime. The work of the police in this case would have been aided materially if reports had been made to the authorities of all cases in which this man was involved. But many persons, thinking him to be a harmless prowler, allowed the suspect to go unmolested until his actions became so violent that they could no longer be ignored. By that time, he had committed three murders and had escaped. I wish to impress upon you the importance of reporting to the police any case of a suspicious nature. Let the police officer decide whether it's important or not. That's his job. The conclusion of the story I shall reserve for the end of the program. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. This may be in your district. At the Montesano Hospital, a woman has just been beaten with a brick. That is all, Morgan. I was... I was lying in bed here, almost asleep, when this man came in. I heard a noise. I thought it was the nurse, but I just rung but Where was the man when you saw him? Well, he, he was standing right there, just about where you are now. He had something in his hand. Was he just standing there? No. No, he was leaning over the bed a little. He had his hand raised up by his face. I could see something in his hand, but I didn't know what it was. I screamed, and, and then he hit me. Did you lose consciousness? Yes, he didn't hit me a hard blow. I, I threw up my arm and sort of sort of knocked his hand out of the way. But I must have fainted. When I came to again, he, he was choking me. I got loose and screamed again, and, and that woke the other women, those over there. And they started screaming, too. What did the man do then? Well, he, he ran out of the window there, right across the terrace, and, and jumped over the railing. Is this the brick he had in his hand? I, I think so. He... He dropped something just as he got to the door. Well, now, you take it easy. Thank we'll make you. a report of this and see what we can find out. Los Angeles Police calling car 12. Car 12 at 103 West 4th Street. Investigate the trouble. Call an ambulance if needed. Morgan. Right this way, officers. This room right in here. Mm. Is this the woman who got beat up? Yes. Looks like she's pretty badly hurt. Run in here, boys. I'll make a report on this as soon as I get some dope on what happened. Mm. When did you discover the woman? About uh, half an hour ago. Mm. She's been hurt longer than that. Well, I know that. That's why we came in when we did. You see, nobody had seen her around for a couple of days, so we decided to investigate. Who is she? Mrs. Elizabeth Barclay. She's from Akron. I see. How long has she been here? About three weeks. Did she have any money? Apparently so. Her clothes were good. She paid her bills promptly. 
Always seemed to have enough to get what you wanted. You uh, ever see this purse before? Oh, oh yes, not the times. It belonged to Mrs. Barclay. You say you haven't seen her for a couple of days. Yes. You see, she didn't come down yesterday, nor today. And when she didn't answer her room phone here, well, we decided we'd better find out what was wrong. I got the janitor, and we took a look through the transom and saw her sitting here in the chair all covered with blood. So, naturally, we investigated. See, You haven't touched anything in the room? Not a thing. But we found Mrs. Barclay heard we called the ambulance and then phoned the police station. Was this brick on the windowsill when you came in? Everything is just exactly the way it was. Nothing has been touched. Well, we'll take it along. No chance of getting any fingerprints off it, and it's a cinch we'll never get any prints off that windowsill. We'll keep in touch with you and let you know if anything comes up. And by the way, nobody saw any strangers loitering around here, did they? No. Well, if you see anybody hanging around this joint that looks suspicious, you call us. I'll do that, yes. Twelve days later, a guest in a downtown hotel reported, When my wife and I woke up this morning, our window was open. My wife's purse was lying on the fire escape. There was a brick lying right beside it in a hat. It had a label in it from a hat store in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Two days later, as the chill February dawn broke... Miss Jones! Miss Jones! There's a bell trying to get in my window! He's got a brick in his hand! Help! Fourteen days later, on March 12th... Mrs. Valdez, are you up yet? That's funny. Mrs. Valdez, it's the morning paper. Something must be wrong. <laughs> Mrs. Valdez, are you all right? Well, I guess I'll try the door. Oh, do leave her. She's dead. <laughs> Again, the telltale brick was found at the scene of the crime. Eighteen days went by. Then on the morning of March 20th, at 523 South Maple, the man awoke. Ah. Ah. What the devil's coming off in here? Hey, get away from that window. Oh, throw a brick at me, will you? Well, I'll fill you so full of holes, you'll look like a used punch board. The early morning hours had affected the aim of the awakened sleeper, and once more the brick-wielding criminal had escaped. Then on the morning of March 27, at 1026 Ingram Street, a telephone rings insistently. Hello? Hey, Grace, what's the matter with you? Why did you answer your phone? I, I can't. I'm hurt. Something's hit me in the head. I, I'm all bloody. Call the police. you get your head all banged up that way? I don't know. I, I, I was lying in bed, and I, I kept hearing the phone ring, but I couldn't answer it. Finally, I, I managed to get enough strength to pick, pick up the phone, and there was a friend of mine, and I had to call the police station because I found out that my head was bleeding pretty badly. Yeah? How'd you get hurt? I I, I really haven't the slightest idea, though. I, I, I must have been hit with this brick. It, it was lying on my bed by the pillow. Oh, one of those cases, eh? Is there an outside window to this apartment close to the ground? Why, the bathroom window opens onto an alley and there's a high fence right under the window. Mind if I take a look at it? <laughs> no, I'll show you. Anything missing in the place? Yes, I, I lost the wristwatch and my purse. Here's the bathroom. Is that screen the same way it was when you came in here first? Yes, sir. Nobody touched anything. Hmm. Well, here's a greasy fingerprint on the windowsill. Where? Right there. Uh, 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 don't touch it. Let me get a good look at that. What are you doing? Smelling of it? Yeah. Unless I miss my guess, the man who made this print is a car washer. Now, look. Don't bother anything. Don't touch anything. And don't clean anything up until I get a fingerprint man out over here. The way I feel now, I'll never clean this place up. Twice more, the brick bat killer struck. Then on the morning of April 4th, 1937... Los Angeles shuddered at the grim details of its latest brickbat murder. Lieutenant of Detectives Patton, Tommy Bryan, and his partner Ray Giese discussed the murder. 
You fellas got anything more on this warden case? Yeah, Ray and I were just looking at the reports a while ago. All these brickbat cases have been assigned to Ray and me. Pretty bad, isn't it? Yes, it is. What's a whole lot worse is the fact that as far as I can determine, this is the 13th crime of the same nature that's been committed in this town since the first of the year. You think all of these brickbat jobs have been done to the same man? I'm sure of it. Same method of operation in at least 10 of the cases. The first one is at the Montesana Hospital. That was back in January. And on the 2nd of February, Mrs. Barkley was discovered in a room in that hotel on 4th Street. Yeah, I remember that case. On the 14th of February, a fellow named Nash reported that his hotel room had been broken into. And in that case, the brick bat was left. On the 16th of February, we had that case in Santee. A girl saw a man trying to climb through a window. He had a brick bat in his hand. This guy's a bricklayer of the first order. And so far, that is, up till the middle of February, he hadn't killed anybody. No, but Mrs. Barclay was unconscious for six weeks. I don't think she'll ever be quite the same. The first murder, and I think we can chalk up to our brickbat carrying friend, is the Valdez case out on Sanford. Say, didn't somebody take a shot at a guy for throwing a brick at him down on Maple or Wall or some of those streets? Yeah, this report shows that we got three complaints from the South Maple address. One on the 20th of March, two on the 31st. We got another on the 30th of March from the 500 block on South Wall. But in between that was the Ingram Street case. That's where you found the greasy fingerprint, wasn't it? Yeah. We had Gaskell make some pictures of that print, but of course the possibilities of finding who it belongs to are very remote. Too indistinct to classify. Besides, we couldn't check all the prints anyway. You told me you were positive that the man who made that print was a car washer. Yes, I had Ray Pinker make an analysis of scrapings from the print. He agrees with me. Besides, we also know that the grease is not differential or transmission grease, but the kind that would naturally accumulate on a sponge or a chamois skin. Well, that definitely makes a car washer out of him and not a mechanic, huh? That's what we think. Well, we found a dusty print on a milk bottle over at the warden place. Apparently, whoever made it had pushed the window up and had set the milk bottle off the windowsill over on the fence to keep from knocking it off. When he did that, he left a dusty print on the milk bottle. Pretty indistinct, but I think Gaskell is going to be able to do something with it. Well, these latent prints are all right if we ever get any others to compare with them. But right now, that's a job that's too big. Well, how about running the cards through the machine and pull out all the cards with the same M.O.? Strange as it may seem, we haven't a single case in our files other than these 13 in this folder right here. Well, didn't anyone get a description of this guy? As near as we can figure out, we've got to look for a car washer about six feet tall, weighing about 150 pounds. But that's all we got to go on. Well, it's a cinch we can't round up every six-foot colored boy we see and ask him if he's a brick bad killer. No, but we can do the next best thing. We can round up every one of them that looks like he might answer that description. And we can compare every fingerprint we take from now on with those we have in this file. Let me study that file. I've got an idea. <laughs> Acting on a suggestion from Lieutenant Bryan, all city employees whose work might bring them in contact with the kind of grease shown in the chemical analysis of the fingerprints were brought in for questioning. Their fingerprints taken and compared with the prints found at the scene of the crime. Thus, every man was eliminated and all suspicion removed from. Then Bryan conferred with Chief of Detectives Joseph Taylor, who was actively working on the case. Well, Chief, we had another brick bat case last night down on Gladys Street. According to the report, the fellow tried to break into a girl's room and... She woke up in time to put in a call to the police, but the guy got away. Think it's the one we were looking for? I'm pretty sure it is. He left a brick bat on the windowsill. Here's something I'd like to check with you, too. I've tabulated the number of times these attacks have been made, and I've tried to determine if there's any sequences to days, but apparently there isn't. Yeah? What have you got? Four on Sunday, two on Saturday, two on Wednesday, three on Tuesday, and two on Monday. Well, apparently there's no pattern there. No, but I've found that it averages one attack every six days. That is, in the period when he's active. Now, this is the 17th. I figure he'll strike again about Wednesday of next week. All right. What do you want to do? I want every available man and every car that you can spare, and let's cover the district from 1st Street at least to 10th and from Figueroa to Central. That's going to take a lot of men. I know it, but we've got to catch this guy before he kills somebody else. All right. And if we haven't got enough men to cover those districts, we'll get them. After night, augmented by 150 extra men, the Los Angeles police combed the district, outlined by Lieutenant Bryan. From housetops, from parked automobiles, even from trees, the officers watched for the murderer. Hundreds of suspects were brought in for questioning. More than half a hundred unsolved cases were broken as a result of these arrests. But still, the brick-bat-wielding slayer escaped detection. 
Chief Taylor, why don't we check the fingerprints we've got on these brickbat cases against the juvenile prints? Look, Tommy, you know it practically takes a court order to get those juvenile prints out of the file. Well, that's a system I don't... I think those prints should be available like all the rest of the fingerprints. Nope, we don't want to run the risk of some guy with a cop complex rousting some youngster around just because his prints happen to be in police report. Meantime, this guy goes around caving in skulls with brickbats. Now, don't let this case get you down, Tommy. Anyhow, you have no reason to believe this killer is a juvenile. No, it's just a hunch, that's all. How much longer you want these extra men? Well, I've about decided that this bird skipped town. It's been four weeks since anything's happened, and if he was still here, he'd have started something before this. Well, you keep the file on it and keep working on the case. Let me know what comes up. Oh, uh, do you have anything in mind on it? Well, I've got a letter here that I'd like you to send out for me. I think it ought to go to every sheriff's office and police department in every town in the United States that has more than 10,000 people. You know, it might be a good idea to send them to Mexico and Canada, too. Yeah? What's the letter about? I'm asking them to give us a report on every case of this sort that they've had and to notify us if they have any other case of the same kind. And the minute we hear from any one of these towns, we'll have a lead. All right, we'll send them out. Although the case of the Brick Bat Slayer apparently was closed and newspapers no longer heralded the exploits of the killer, Lieutenant Bryan kept the case in his active file. Every person arrested who even remotely resembled the suspect had his fingerprints taken and compared with the latent prints on file. Then from Chicago came a letter which Bryan discussed with Chief Taylor. Well, Chief, I just got a letter from the Chicago police that convinces me the man we're looking for came from Chicago. That's so? What does it say? Yeah, it says, uh, replying to your letter regarding Brick Bat Murderer. We received a report from E. Richards of the Hotel Devonshire on the morning of June 29th, 1936. Mr. Richards! Mr. Richards! My mommy's bloody all over. Gee, you better go up and see. I want my grandma. I don't want to stay here anymore. Oh, now, Jimmy, your mother's all right. A little boy like you shouldn't be up so early. I tell you, my mommy's hurt. A man hit her with a brick. Gee, I don't want to stay here. Well, all right. Come on, Jimmy. Let's take a ride up in the elevator. We'll see what's the matter. No, no, I don't want to. I'm afraid. You didn't sleep with your clothes on, did you, Jimmy? No, I, I put them on this morning. Oh, well, surely if your mother's been hurt as badly as you say, you wouldn't have stopped to dress. But I tell you, she's hurt. Did you lock the door, Jimmy, when you came out? No, sir, it's, it's unlocked. Well, let's go in. No, I don't want to. I'm afraid. Ah, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh-oh. Jimmy. Didn't you hear anything during the night? Yes, I, I woke up in the night. It was real dark. I saw a big man standing over the bed, and, and he was hitting my mommy with something all wrapped up. Didn't you do anything? Yes, I said, hey, you let my mommy alone. Well, did he quit? No. No, he said for me to keep quiet. He said he was a doctor, and he was fixing my mommy's ear. Oh. And after a while, he went over to the dresser there, and, and then he left. Hmm. And I went back to sleep, and, and that's all I saw when I woke up this morning. The letter goes on to say that there were a lot of fingerprints around the place, and that on the mirror, the killer had written with lipstick the words, Black Legion Game. Weren't they having a lot of trouble there with the Black Legion about that time? Yes, and I have an idea that the mirror writing was just a red herring trick. Hmm. Did they check the boy's story? Yeah, and apparently he stuck to it because they made a couple of arrests, but they never pinned the murder on anybody. Uh, but, Tom, this happened before our own case. Yes, it? I know it did. The way I figured is this. The fellow who did that job is the same one we had out here. Well, that gets us nowhere. That's right. Except... The only thing to do now is to watch for another case like this in Chicago and then get on the job quick. But I got a hunch that if he came from Chicago, he's going back there. And it's a cinch he won't be able to resist that brick bat mania of his very long. Tommy, will you put that paper down and come to bed? Yeah, just a minute. What are you doing? Reading the wanted? No. You've been reading that paper every night. What do you find so interesting? Well, I got a letter last week from Les White, and he sent me a clipping about a brick bat murder in Chicago. So I'm just looking for brick bat murders. Oh, for heaven's sake. Are you going to spend the rest of your life working on that case? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, if I have to. Well, at least get home in time to read the paper before midnight. Oh, boy. What now, Listen Sherlock? Listen to this. Chicago, Illinois. Police today arrested Thomas Crosby, Negro car washer, 17, as a suspect in the death of Anna Cook, Chicago nurse, who was murdered on the morning of August 21st. So what? Why all the excitement? You mean to say you didn't read that story? Now, look, Tommy. I married a detective. I've been a good wife to you, haven't I? Yeah, but, gee, but you ought to read I about these I didn't agree things. to read murder stories. I get enough of that from listening to you. Where's my hat? Right where you always leave it when you come in. On the table in the hall. Hey, where do you think you're going this time of night? I'm going to headquarters, lady. And what do you think you're going to do there? I'm going to find out if we've got the fingerprints of Thomas Crosby. Well, what if you have? If we have and they match up with a certain print I've got in mind, I'll be flying to Chicago tomorrow morning. Oh, why did I ever marry a detective in the homicide squad? Tough luck, honey. Goodbye now. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Gasco, come here a minute. Tommy, if you say brick bat to me, I'm going to brain you. Never mind the horse play. Come on, come on. I want some prints. You got the fingerprints of Thomas Crosby? Well, listen, Tommy, we've got 425,000 fingerprints in this joint. You asked me for Thomas Crosby. Now pull yourself together, Brian. What's it all about? Will you please pull the card on Thomas Crosby? Yes, Mr. Brian. How do you spell it? Crosby. C-R-O-S-B-Y. Crosby. 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 What's the first name? Oh, for the love of... Uh, Thomas. Thomas Crosby. Yes, Mr. Bryan. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you are. Thomas Crosby. He's a juvenile, 17 years old, picked up in 1937 for vagrancy. Five feet, 11 inches tall, weighs 150 pounds. Was he picked up in the night or the daytime? What difference does it make? Well, if he was picked up at night, his prints weren't compared with those we've got in our files. Cockeyed idea for protecting some of these juveniles is beginning to get in my hair. Well, my friend, I'm afraid that the prints are in the juvenile file and you can't see them till morning. All right, all right. Do me a favor, Gaskell. Remember those prints we got from Chicago on that castle case? You mean the woman that was killed in the hotel with the little boy in bed with her? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Sure, I remember. Her in the file. Hello, Tommy. Oh, hello there, Captain. What are you doing down here this time of night? Captain Doyle, you're just the man we need. Think so? How come? Look. Here's a card on a kid named Crosby. Radio singer? No, no, no. Brick Bat Slayer. That's so? How do you know? Well, I don't. But he was picked up today in Chicago on suspicion of doing the same kind of job that our Brick Bat murderer was doing around here. Let me see the card. Hmm. This guy's a juvenile. Yeah. That's where you come in. You know the rules, Tommy. Sure I do, Captain. But look, I'll bet my right eye that this man's the guy we're looking for. Give me a break and unlock the file and let's compare these prints, will you? There's going to be a whole lot of trouble if you're wrong on this, Brian. There's going to be a whole lot more trouble if I'm right and we don't do it. Well, there's a point to that, too. Come on, let's go. <laughs> well, I hope this works out. You've been putting a lot of time in on this case, haven't you? Ever since April of last year. Mm, 16 months, eh? Yeah, 16 months. What time I wasn't working on other cases. Did you say Thomas Crosby? Yes, sir, Thomas Crosby. Juvenile, 17 years old, colored. Okay. There you are. Okay, we'll get to work on it. Come on, Tommy. Hey, Woodruff, you found those prints yet on the castle case? Yeah, they are. Hand me that glass, will you, Tommy? Mm -hmm. Well, how about it? Sherlock, I'm afraid you've got something. Yeah? The same fingers that made the prints on this card are the ones that made the prints on Mrs. Castle's mirror. Hot dog. Let's get a wire off to Chicago. What are you going to do? I'm going to help them pin the castle murder on that Crosby bird, and while they're doing that, I'm going to try to tie him up with the brickbat killings here. And just how are you going to do that? Castle, will you do me a favor and compare those latent prints we got off that milk bottle in that Olive Street murder with these Crosby prints? Oh, that's it, eh? Why didn't you say so? I've got those prints in the drawer. Oh, I've got a hunch on this, and if it works, we've got our brickbat killing solved. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid they're solved. Because in my opinion, these latent prints were made by Thomas Crosby. Lieutenant Bryan phoned Chicago the discovery made by the Los Angeles police. Next day, Lieutenants Gaskell and Bryan left to question the suspect. In Chicago, they were met by Captain Crane. Hello, boys. Sorry to keep you waiting. Yeah, we'd begun to think you've forgotten our appointment. Well, you know how things are. Everything's upset. This is a pretty important case to us. Well, it isn't exactly a parking ticket to us. Oh, pardon me. This is Lieutenant Gaskell, our fingerprint man. Good to know you. He's the man who made Crosby's prints on the castle case. Yeah. Nice work, Lieutenant. Thank you. Hey, Chief, let's get down to cases. Just what's the runaround all about? We've been here two days and we haven't been able to talk to Crosby yet. What's the answer? Well, frankly, we've been trying to clear up some more of our unsolved cases with Mr. Crosby. However, he's right here in the next room. 
You boys are ready. I think we can talk to him. Well, I'm ready any time you are. Okay. You want to take a statement? Yeah, if you don't mind. Not at all. You can use the same stenographer he's working with him now. Crosby, here's some boys from Los Angeles. They want to talk to you. Listen, copper. I told you my name was Nicky. Now, don't be going around here calling me Crosby. Another crack like that out of you, and I'll bend a blackjack over your head. Nuts to you. What do you guys want? That's good, huh? Now, let's get something straight right now. You guys play square with me, and I'll play square with you. I'm tough, and I know it. I don't want no smart cracks about it. All right, Crosby, if that's the way you feel about it. My name is Nixon. Oh, okay, Nixon. I'm Lieutenant Bryan from Los Angeles. Yeah. This is Lieutenant Gaskell. We've made a comparison of the fingerprints that we found at the scene of a murder in Los Angeles with the ones on your record card. And they're the same ones. So what? Well, we want to know if you're willing to admit these brick bat attacks we've had on the coast. Do I go back there? Back to Los Angeles? Yeah. Maybe. Sure, sure, I admit them. What do you want to know about them? Did you beat up that woman on Ingram Street? Is that the one close to Wiltshire? Yeah. Sure, sure, I hit her. She was going to wake up and yell for the cops, so I let her have it with a brick. How about that murder out on Stanford? Now, I don't know nothing about that. Did you kill the woman and her daughter up on Olive Street? Is that the street up on top of the hill? That's the one. Yeah, yeah, I killed him. It was going to holler, too, so I just caved him in with a brick. Did you pick up that milk bottle? Yeah, yeah, they tell me that's where I made my mistake. Yeah, <laughs> you did all right. Anything else you want to tell us? <laughs> no, no, but there's sure something these Chicago cops would like to know. <laughs> huh? What's that? Well, you hear about that murder in that Wabash Avenue hotel? Yeah. Well, I've done that one. Is that so? Yeah. Remember that gal in the hotel over on Washington Street? The one that her room was on fire? Yeah. And yeah, we heard about it. It was a bad job. Yeah, man. <laughs> I've done that. Well, you certainly get around, don't you? I sure do. Say, when are we going to start back for Los Angeles? Oh. <laughs> You're not going to start back. Huh? How come? No. No, we're going to leave you in Illinois. Out in California, you're a juvenile. You'd just go to prison for a little while. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah. But in Illinois, your age won't make any difference. They'll electrocute you. <laughs> so long, tough guy. <laughs> just a moment, Chief Davis will give us concluding facts regarding our program. But while he's coming to the microphone, may I suggest the best safeguard you can give your motor is Real Lube, the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. A worthy running mate for Rio Grande Crack. The great police car performance gasoline that is first in public service. The most highly recommended gasoline sold in this section of the country. And now, Chief Davis. Crosby, alias Nixon, was tried in Cook County, Illinois on July 28th and found guilty of murder and sentenced to die in the electric chair. In a statement today to Los Angeles detectives in Chicago, he confessed to the murder of Mrs. Valdez. He will be executed one week from tonight. Companions, which he had implicated in later statements to our officers, have been apprehended and will be brought to justice. Again, crime has failed to pay. Thank you, Chief Davis. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That is all, Arnold. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. week at this time, Rio Grande will present The Case of the Swollen Face. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.